Hi, my name is Gabe Dara. I'm an undergraduate student at Northwestern University. Welcome to Cape Clinicians. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Chidi Akusevi, a seventh year student at Harvard M Medical School's MD PhD program, where he recently defended his thesis, thereby completing the PhD part of the program. Dr. Chidi Akusevi has made many headways in medical communication and research, and today we're going to be asking him many questions on various topics ranging from the MCAT, the COVID-19 vaccines, what to do as a pre-med, how to survive in medical school. So if you have any particular concerns or topics that you just want to learn quickly, I'm leaving timestamps down in the description below. But besides that, just stay for the ride. Let's go. Okay, so I just wanted to ask um, a few questions and I think a lot of people um, when they hear about the Harvard MD PhD program they're like uh, whoa how you uh, do that what's entailed and is it balanced more towards research or more towards medicine and I just wanted to know what is a typical day like that for you uh, in the program where do you spend most of your time um, is it with the patient in the lab, in front of your computer? Uh, how do you uh, use and what are those? Yeah, so my day and how I spend my day really depends on what phase of the program I am in. The MD-PhD program is split into several sort of training periods. The first is two years of medical school. And then after that, you do four or five, six years of a PhD. And then after that, you spend the last two years in medical school. And each of those time periods in your program has a different has a different schedule. And so in the first years of medical school, you're learning the basic science and the medicine um, in classrooms. And so the days are really spent going to class, whether it be virtual or in person, learning the material, studying in the afternoon, and then uh, taking exams. And so you can think about that first years of the MD PhD program as really just being a medical student in the, in the canonical sense. And then when you transition to the PhD, you're really spending your time in the lab doing experiments, reading papers, learning how to become a scientist. And so I defended my PhD last year in July of 2020. Um, and before that, I spent, you know, four years working in the lab and my days were really based on the work I was doing um, in the laboratory. And then Finally, the last two years of the MD-PhD program is when you go back to medical school, but this time you are working in the hospital and that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm in my pediatrics rotation. And in those final two years, you are actually in the hospital in front of patients, learning how to take care of patients, learning how to actually practice medicine. And so instead of learning medicine, you're actually doing medicine. And so my days are already spent waking up early, going to the hospital and working with residents and attendings and other uh, people in the medical team to take care of patients. Okay, great. That's a full busy schedule, sounds like. So you're not just at any MD PhD program, you are at Harvard's MD PhD program. So being at this apex institution, uh, what would you say makes it so different and like stand out? Is there anything in Harvard's curriculum or standard of care that just makes it so high and above industry standard? Yeah, well, one, I'll push back and say that there are a lot of great institutions. Harvard is, of course, one of them, but we have peer institutions that are phenomenal as well. And so when people are thinking about where do I want to go to medical school, where do I want to do a PhD, they should not only think of Harvard as the, like, the sole place that they can be, as the absolute best place that can be. That being said, Harvard is a great institution, and it has a lot of uh, qualities and it has a lot of attributes to it that make it great. So one of them is resources. There's a lot of money at Harvard. Again, this is not specific to Harvard. Lots of universities have lots of resources, but it helps to be at a university that can fund lots of types of research. It can fund uh, and attract some of the best talents around the world and within America to come train at Harvard. So that's one. Number two, opportunities. There are Harvard's a big university. There are a lot of faculty within the Harvard Medical School alone. There's over 9,000 different physicians and scientists. And so when you have a lot of people who are that talented, any interest that you have, anything that you would want to engage in, Harvard probably has someone there 
uh, working on that same topic. And so I think the, the strength of its resources financially, the number of people who are at Harvard and doing really interesting work um, helps. Okay, uh, thank you, but uh, I know its resources are a huge asset, but another obstacle that so many um, pre-meds and just aspiring uh, students face is uh, unfortunately the MCAT. So, and it's just been a problem uh, from day one, even though it's getting less and less emphasized. So what is your number one tip just to uh, crack down on the six exam to prepare? And yeah, I took the MCAT back in 2000 and 12 so it's the old mcat over now nine years ago um and so i understand a new mcat now has additional sections like social sciences and is also longer i believe but i think the advice that i have can still be translated to the new mcat so number one is having a study schedule a lot of people say i'm going to study for the mcat but then have no idea of what they need to study and when they need to study it so that they're prepared by the time the test comes and so before you start studying for the MCAT, you need to come up with a schedule to actually define how you're going to study and what you're going to study and over what time period. And that way you can keep yourself on track. And if you're not keeping yourself on track, you will know because you can look at your schedule and say, oh, I'm actually two days behind or a week behind. So keeping with a schedule is important Two practice tests, practice test, practice test, practice test. You don't want to have the first time you take an MCAT test be the actual test that you are taking for uh, for credit. And so I highly recommend that people before they even study, take a practice test to see where they're at, to see what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and tailor that schedule to how you can best improve your weaknesses because you're only as good as your weakest section. And then from there, you wanna schedule practice tests intermittently during your schedule so you can have a sense of whether or not your study strategy is being reflected into higher scores. And so practice tests are a way of taking a temperature of how well you're doing and also potentially galvanizing you to work harder if you feel like if you get if you're taking these tests and they're not you're not scoring as highly as you want. Number three, you need to really understand how you study and set yourself up for success. And so by that I mean if you're someone who needs to turn off your phone, if you're someone who needs to get off the internet and work in a secluded, quiet place, do that. Don't try and study in ways that are actually counterproductive to the best way that you can study it and works for you. And so for me, when I was studying, I had to really like bar myself from any distractions from the internet and also from friends. Some people like using classes. If you're someone who appreciates and learns from classes then sign up for a class. If you're someone who studies with friends, then like find a friend who's also taking the MCAT and like work out a schedule together. But there are lots of different ways that one can study and it's be you have to be sure that you're studying in a way that works best for you. All right. So that that was wonderful, but I understand that you've done a lot of remarkable work in medical communication and you recently you've been disseminating tons of information about the COVID vaccine. But I know a question on so many people's minds, including mine, is when do you think the vaccine would be available to everyone? When can just the normal uh, American man get it or woman or anybody? Or when can we just uh, not be in a healthcare scenario but still have access to it? Yeah, I mean, that's a question that's best answered by someone in administration who's in charge of vaccine distribution. So all I can really tell you is based on what I've read from, you know, from governments. Um, and it seems like, at least for the state of Massachusetts, March, April is the time in which the vaccine is going to be uh, available to people who are not in high risk populations or who are frontline workers. Every state is going to be different. And so I cannot answer for the other 49 states. I do think that in a best case scenario, March, April, May is when the vaccine should start being rolled out to everyone in the US. But that is something that is completely out of my hands. Okay. Well, uh, that's good news, but uh, my last real uh, bugging question was with uh, everything that's gone on in the past year and with the horrible story of Dr. Susan Moore who was denied treatment. And now that we know that COVID disproportionately affects African-Americans and not 
due to genetic reasons, but due to disparities in treatment and healthcare services. Uh, would you say that there's some level of racism in the healthcare uh, industry? And maybe what is your experience with it? And what do you think minority kids who want to go to medicine should do? Yeah, so the answer is yes, there's absolutely med racism in medicine, and that's because there's racism in every aspect of American life. It's baked into our institutions, and that is something that it seems like more people are starting to realize, and that's good. And so I want to fight off, say, um, state the obvious, which is that there's uh, institutional racism in medicine, there's systemic racism in medicine, um, and that is not to be, that's not surprising if you think about the way that America is structured. And so when thinking about how to combat this, it's really, number one, important for healthcare professionals to be educated on the ways in which biases and racist systems fail black and brown patients. And so the case that you brought up was a very unfortunate case. And it's an example of black patients talking about their pain, talking about their symptoms and being overlooked and not being taken seriously. That is something that happens in, in medicine quite often. Um, when thinking about who is more likely to get sick from COVID, there are lots of societal issues that puts black and brown people at higher risk for being exposed. And then combine that with underlying health conditions that many of black and brown patients have because of, again, the way that society is structured. And now you have a situation where people are not only being more exposed to COVID, but they are also more likely to have an adverse outcome like death from COVID. And so, again, if you're someone who's interested in going into medicine, it's important to know this, to learn it, to study it. And so that when you actually encounter it, you're able to name it and combat it. So that's one. The second thing I would say is for me, have I experienced it? That was, I think your second question. I, I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, if you talk to any healthcare professional who's black or brown and they have stories of people sort of miss uh, mislabeling you, thinking that you are someone who you're not. So if you're a physician and you're a black woman, they may they may automatically assume that you're the nurse, for instance. Or for me, uh, assuming that I'm like someone who's transporting patients instead of a medical student. That happens all the time. Um, and I think if you're again interested in entering into into this profession, especially if you're a minority individual, know this. Um, and seek community from people who are who are like you, because I think that's the best way to uh, to prevent yourself from feeling down. Uh, and then also standing up and using your voice to say, "Hey, this is wrong, and we're going to change," because that's the only way that uh, things will move forward. And I am grateful that more and more of our white allies and uh, white friends are standing up uh, to this issue. So it's no longer something that Black and Brown people have to be. Uh, involved in and like championing, but it's becoming more widely accepted for other people to take up the fight as well. Right. Well, we hope things will get better in the near future. But uh, so far, thank you so much, Dr. Chitty. You've been amazing. And I think we've all left here with a bit more insight and information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for more on Dr. Chitty, uh, you can view his pamphlets on both the COVID coronavirus vaccines, and I'll leave his, his links down in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.